This week on the Sports Initiative podcast, I sit down with up-and-coming assistant head of coaching at Crystal Palace, Paul Barry. He discusses his time at Southend and Arsenal and the lessons he learnt from both clubs, Arsenal's Academy Island psychological profile and how this helped players and coaches, as well as the importance of individualising triggers and not being too generic with team principles. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure you share it with friends and family. I hope you enjoy. Listen, so Paul, nice to have a catch up with you briefly there before we hit the record button. Um, but I guess first question, are you good, all safe and well, everyone happy, happy in your household, etc.? Yeah, we're doing fine. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for the invite to come on and uh, have a chat with you this evening. Um, yeah, we're all, we're all fit and well and healthy and uh, looking forward to uh, hopefully a, a different festive Christmas to uh, this time last year when it was all a bit strange and uh a bit isolated, wasn't it, at that time? But we're all good. We're all good. How about you guys? Yeah, all good. I definitely hope for a different Christmas because I had COVID last year. So it'd be nice oh, to uh, spend a bit of time actually with the other half. We separated in our house to try and protect her. Obviously, at the time, there was no vaccines or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. fingers crossed we can all get to there, which would be nice. So, um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I asked you to come on. It, it, it'd be really interesting uh, conversation, I think, with some of the projects, etc., that you... Um, both have done and maybe have coming up for for people that aren't necessarily aware of you or your background do you want to provide a little bit of a summary in terms of your journey of whistle stop tour to where you are now and what's coming up in the future potentially yeah no worries so um it's a pretty vast and extensive um period of time that i've been coaching for so it's over 20 years and i'm sort of into my 25th year of, of football coaching so it's a long long, long time I'd say pretty much half of that has been in, in grassroots football and working in football and the community schemes and programs. Um, and initially, right at the very, very start, going through my level two as a volunteer for my local grassroots club. That's the, the bulk of that time was, was, was part-time work, after-school clubs, evening work, just, just trying to gain confidence and, and knowledge in football and and an understanding of how to work with young people, that sort of thing, role modelling a lot of the coaches that I was watching during that sort of a start to my, my football coaching journey. And in, in the, the last 12 years, I've been coaching in professional football academies. So I've worked for four different football clubs, um, going right back to the beginning of sort of 2010. This is even before the, like the EPPP was introduced. So it's more of a centre of excellence. I was at Dagenham and Redbridge for a couple of years. But the bulk of that time has been um, a mixture of Category 3, part-time, then full-time lead foundation phase roles at Southend United for nearly six years. Um, and then a full-time role as an assistant foundation phase lead and age group coach at Arsenal for nearly four years. And then this current year, I've been working um, at Watford Football Club in a role supporting the foundation phase and supporting the coaches with some sort of coach development so that's been fun. Um, numerous other uh, side ventures that I'm sure we'll get into talking about across the conversation. And then I've got a very exciting um, uh, job move at the beginning of next year in January 2022 to move to Crystal Palace as assistant head of coaching with the under eights to under 12s. So it's a, a role that I'm um, very, very grateful for and appreciative to be given. The uh, It's a brilliant opportunity for me, a great progression and, and one that I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, I think that shows kind of a nice little journey there. And I'm sure we'll take some stops off and touch on those later on. I guess the first question for me, which is um, linking a little bit into what you're going to do in January, but also to what you've done previously, is when you are going into a new club, who are obviously going to have philosophies that are slightly different from club to club and ideas, etc. How would you go around... I guess one, finding out what those philosophies and uh, culture is, and two, I guess then embedding yourself in that culture, and maybe both accepting some of their ideas, but maybe challenging some of their workings as well. Because you know, with your level of experience, there's going to be comes in and go, well, maybe try stuff in this direction. So, how do you go around doing that? Yeah, I think you know, in recent 
years that the main bulk of my experience regarding going into a club and having to be educated to a club's um in line with the club's vision and values and philosophy and syllabuses and curriculums all that pre-existing work that you're going into um that was my role at arsenal really such a huge football club and to um to go in there from a category three club to obviously a huge category one club it was a very daunting um opening sort of time period to my role there but it was a from memory, a lot of meetings to sit through, um, a lot of um, a large a long period of of induction, meeting lots of people from different departments, lots of observation in those early months. Really, of course, working with the players immediately, but lots of observation of of, of good practice, um, of of ha- how that the club works regarding their playing philosophy, their um, work philosophy, the culture. So for me, when you're moving into a new role at a new football club, the opening period of time that you work there has to be patience, observation, relationship building, getting to know people from different departments and how they affect your day-to-day work. And of course, the kids and the parents that you're directly responsible for within your role. Um, That's what I think the opening few months of a, a new position should look like, even if you may go in and, and perhaps even disagree or it's uh, against the way of thinking that perhaps you've been educated with previously. I think the early stages should be about looking, listening, relationship building, um, and developing your mindset to fall in line with that new club. Only then when I think you are in a position to feel confident and familiar with, and you've built those strong connections, can you start, you know, putting across more opinion and critiquing, but those things have to come later for me. Um, I think there's a, a lot of observation and listening and, and, and watching that comes in those those early early months of a, of a new role. And is that, um, I guess, that observation, is that kind of phase-specific, specific, age group-specific, or is that up and down the pathway? So would you go and watch what the pre-academy site does all the way up to what the youth team does to see kind of where you fit in? What does that look like in terms of that? observation period you're absolutely spot on so the bulk of my experience is working in the foundation phase with with sort of pre-academy age groups up to under 11s under 12s but within a full-time football club role you have to be adaptable so a large part of my full-time football career has been um, covering sessions in older age groups assisting co-delivering in the youth development phase watching the youth team train um, where possible getting involved in in those programs where, when time allows um, so, of course, you're face specific when you're full time, but you have to show willingness to learn and see where those players are going to be moving into. So from a foundation phase, what the youth development phase looks like, what's the expectations, what, what's the difference in, in, in player culture from one phase to the next, how the boys physically and tactically develop across those formative years. But then going back to the, the beforehand aspect of it, what does the pre-academy look like? What does it look like the players that are moving into your phase in the next sort of two to three years? You have to know really what's either side of it, the before and the after, to appreciate the job that you need to do for those boys that are obviously that that you have a duty of care for within the phase. And I guess a question for me that comes off the back of this, in your opinion, what's the biggest difference between a category three, a cat three, um foundation phase compared to a cat one foundation phase what is the major difference between those two are you speaking more along the lines of the program itself or the the players and what they're like to to work with i guess both i guess both because i think both probably have interesting avenues to explore yeah it's just the the um the size of the of the club i think makes a huge difference i mean going from a category three club into a category one club it's just the provision that's there to support and develop the the players so for example you may be going from a club that have half a dozen maybe six seven um full-time staff into a club that probably have around 35 to 40 or more full-time staff so heads of departments intentional work regarding psychology sports science medicine um well-being all of those departments have a massive impact upon the development of each individual player. That's one of the biggest differences for me, just the amount of support, the support network that is behind the, the coach, the coaches, 
and, and can supplement the provision and the development of the boys from different perspectives off the pitch as well as on it. So for me, that's the biggest difference as far as programs are concerned, just the, the sheer size difference from, from a Category 3 to a Category 1. I would say that the, the main player difference that I noticed when moving to Arsenal was just the, the sheer technical proficiency of the players, how clean they were technically, how well they managed the ball in tight areas, their ability to control the ball and affect the game um, in challenging moments when there was high multiple pressure from opposition. Um, so from a technical perspective, that was clear to see and, and evident from, from an early stage and just, um, I'd say, a vast difference in athleticism. So you're working with boys that are probably, when they're at school, they're the fastest runner at school or the best cross-country runner, the best basketball player, the best rugby player. These are a top-end athletes that have probably got a chance of being quite successful in a number of sports because they're just athletically very, very talented. So I'd say they're the, the biggest visual sort of changes and, and um, differences going across the different categories that I've seen in my time. Okay, so going to the provision side, how does that challenge you as a coach? Because I'd imagine if you're coming in from maybe not having that psychology provision or not having that S&C provision at every session or for player audits, et cetera. And then, you know, that's last week. And then on Monday, I'm coming in at 12 o'clock, designing my session, and I've got an S&C coach going, actually, your loading's too high. Or have you thought about your area size to get more Axels, D-cells in over or high velocity running or whatever that looks like? That could be quite challenging for you. So how, how do you manage that I guess journey from going I might not have an understanding of what this looks like in a session by session basis and what do you do to try and gain that knowledge so you become more proficient in that yeah it's a really good question I think when you make that sort of move that I, I have done um, I think you just be a very very open-minded person and a very open-minded coach and be willing to listen to, to new ideas and fresh knowledge um, and I've been so fortunate to work with some really world-class practitioners in a, a sports science capacity, in a, a player welfare capacity. Um, and I was always very, very willing to listen and absorb all of that information because that was brilliant CPD for me at the time. Um, and I actually used that provision for my own benefit as well, just my own knowledge, even away from football, just to understand the, the, the better practices and the, the finer attention to detail that a sports scientist can provide. For a young person, content of what can boost players' confidence and self-esteem, and how they deal with um, and improve their resilience, I just think it's been open-minded and, and at times been ready to sit down and have those, those discussions with those guys because they're experts in their fields, and everyone's in it for the same reasons in an academy. We're all in it to to give each player the, the very best chance of being successful or as successful as they can, whether that's with that club or in the long term, another club potentially. So, yeah, open-mindedness for me and, and willingness to listen and learn for the benefit of yourself um, and, of course, all the kids because they're, they're, they're the most important ones. They're the ones that, um, that we're there um, to provide this, this uh, support network for. And is there any example you could give of uh, a bit of information or a bit of challenge that someone provided you uh, during that time about one of your sessions when you thought, wow, that's really simple, but actually how much more effective, how much better does that make make my session? Yeah, I think area sizes, we've, we've, we've touched upon briefly there. Um, anyway, it was something that I had no real appreciation of, I think, moving from, from a, a Category 3 club, as Southend was, to a Category 1 club in Arsenal. Um, and the sports science um, team were, were very willing to talk to us about just the intricacies of even a modifying a training size, what different fitness and or football fitness adaptations can be um, elicited from that particular practice. So the smaller the size of the area, the more agility type of components you're going to be working on, more stop starts, more uh, turning, uh, dynamic balance, having to maintain your balance while moving quickly compared to the larger size areas when you're going to be looking at more sort of linear running, uh, moving into more speed endurance types of um, adaptations. So, and I, I still think of that today when I'm, I'm there designing sessions. I think what fitness 
returns are we looking to elicit within this practice? And if it's going to be short and sharp and agility based, of course, the area size needs to needs to correspond to that. Um, yeah. And, and at what point you do it in the week? So leading up to a game on a Sunday, for example, if you're training on a Saturday, of course, be mindful of the not just the loading on the players, but again, the training sizes and, and what sort of football fitness returns you're going to get. So I think that's a, a real interesting one for me to, to have learned that over the, the course of the last few years and one that I, I still think of as, as a valid point of reference when you're designing any session to think about what adaptations from a, a sports science perspective um, are, are possible within any session. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really interesting topic at the minute. And I think it's probably an area where quite a lot of clubs and coaches are making gains in terms of understanding how players' body works and how we can actually change and adapt our sessions to give them different outcomes and what that looks like. Um, and what about from a psychological perspective? Is there any work you've done in that space where um, I know that obviously 9s, 10s, 11s, they're going to be naturally probably more up and down as their performance because they're young kids and they're going to have a good day at school, bad day at school and different day at school. But is there anything that uh, you've seen in that space where you thought, actually, that was a really good bit of work to try and help that individual with whatever challenge they were facing? Yeah, Arsenal had a, a fantastic um, concept called Academy Island and you can you can Google it. I believe there's a video introducing it and, and giving it some uh, detail on, on YouTube as well. And it was basically the analogy of um, a make-believe island which had various um, names of places within within the island itself um, and it was it was made into a, a very very big sort of a graphic and image and put on the wall within the psychology sort of room the main psychology room and it was a case for players to spend time looking at this island with members of staff football staff psychology staff welfare staff and and see where they sat within the island. So I'm, as the conversation goes on, I might remember some of the names of some of the actual places, but they were always all referenced around mindset. So when you're in a difficult place, whether that's through difficulties at home or a challenging situation at school, there was a particular place on the island that perhaps corresponded to that. And it was all analogy based, but the players understood it because it allowed them to reference how they were feeling at that particular time. And then you could see a point on, on the map itself where they wanted to move to that was allowing them to think more positively um, and to and to have that ambition to move towards a, a more positive mindset. So that was something that I really enjoyed sort of getting to understand and sat in on some very interesting meetings and conversations with, with players. Um, and yeah, fr from memory, it was something that, that the kids really bought into. Um, I think when you use analogies in that sort of context, it allows players to escape from that moment of football and it allows them to just to relax and 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 divulge perhaps what the the issue might be. It was just a, a really really cool and engaging piece of work. Yeah, I've just been googling as you've been talking. There, it is on the internet, so you can yeah. find it. If quick Google of uh, Arsenal Academy Island, and it does come up. So I'll be having a watch of that later. Even as a Tottenham fan, I think that would be a really <laughs> interesting way of um, looking about it, looking about how you can support. Players. I think that's, yeah, as you said, analogies are a great way of in, engaging with with individuals, and I guess being having that body of work to refer to, it then allows you as a coach to maybe um, understand some of the challenges they're facing away from away from football. Um, I know having you know I played in QPR when I was younger and seeing some of the challenges boys, boys face I always found it was interesting like I was fortunate I had my dad and my grandparents to drive me straight to training and pick me up I was really lucky on that front but then you speak to some of the other players and they're like no I took two buses and a train to get here and actually they would might be 10 minutes late and get told off you're like well actually they've had it far harder than I have because I've got picked up from school, dropped off at the entrance, easy. Whereas they've had all these challenges and had to show them resilience to get across London to be there. And imagine you would see quite a few examples of kids being resilient in order to be part of it um, and be part of the academy system. Yeah, I think that that's a, a, a massive sort of talking point re regarding where players um, 
come from. I mean, you think about where Arsenal's based and currently where I'm um, working at, at Watford. The kids are coming from from very, very different sort of points within the local areas, you know, different parts of London, Hertfordshire, Suffolk, Essex. And so we can't jump on these kids if, and, and start putting blame at their door if they're if they're late for sessions. We need to find out why and if they're okay and and how the parenting side of things works. Of course, I think when you're more of a, an inexperienced younger coach, like you just mentioned there, the first thing you, you feel um, the automatic response is to, is to blame the player. Um, and that's probably the most unfair thing you can do, as if the player would ever want to be late for football, particularly working in the foundation phase. Those kids can't get on the pitch quick enough. They literally sprint from their cars onto the training pitch. So it's, it's a case of getting to understand each situation as much as you're able to and understand the, di- the difficulties that some parents have in getting their kids to train in, the lengths they go to. The parents are excellent from, for, from what I've seen in my experience for the most part in academies. They, they ferry their kids around four times a week, often straight from school, often eating dinner in the car on the way to football, trying to do homework in the car on the way to and on the way home. Um, there's a lot of pressure on these parents and I, I think we need to understand um, and, and support them as much as possible to understand why perhaps they're, they're late from time to time, um, and and to to give them that 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 support from us is is something that's really really important, I believe. And in terms of a, a philosophy of playing style from from Arsenal, um, what if if you were to go and watch an Arsenal team at a weekend, what would they expect you to see? What would they want to see from their players? Yeah, yeah, two key areas really, um, and I'm sure other clubs have have similar um, playing styles or, or terminology. It really was, was two areas, sort of in possession and out of possession. That you'd hope would be quite sort of apparent when you watch them train and play, which was to dominate possession, to create chances and score goals primarily um, as a as an in possession sort of sort of a philosophy. So really to, to learn the solutions that solve every opponent's pressing strategies. So I remember we'd sit down as a phase and we'd look at all the different ways that teams in 7v7, 8v8, 9v9, the different ways that teams could press us, whether that's from restarts or with an open play, different um, ways that, or different parts of the pitch, who might press us, how, when the ball's moved here, who might press us and how. And so it was to go into the, the real intricacies and complexities about how to learn how to solve those issues and problems. That's the level of detail that you can go into when you're at a Cap 1 club because you've just got the, the support network behind you from a staff perspective as, as well as very, very high-end, top-quality players. Um, we used a lot of shapes, so triangles, diamonds, trying to create those shapes on the pitch which correspond to passing options. Um, we look we looked very extensively at, at rotations, interchanging of positions, where they are on the pitch, unselfish runs to create space. So lots and lots of exciting movement off the ball, um, lots of exploiting of space. That's what you would expect to see um, watching players of, of that sort of category one quality, I think. Um, and then from an out of possession perspective, really aggressive, winning the ball back immediately after losing possession. We, we did a lot, of, an awful lot of work on counter pressing. Um, so those initial few seconds of losing the ball, being aggressive to hunt it back in those initial two, three or four seconds. Um, but then even the, the attention to detail was to strip that back sort of, um, several seconds as to what our possession looks like in any one moment. So we talk about uncomfortable, uncomfortable or secure and insecure possession. So if our possession at any one time looks insecure or uncomfortable and it looks like we're about to lose the ball, we start to look at what the connections to the ball might look like from the, the player's teammates. So all, already anticipating the ball being lost. So and that's real, that's real high-end stuff for young players to understand. But if you if you use the right terminology and you're you have clarity within your coaching messages, the players can understand that. So it's anticipating that loss of possession to then be able to counter press more efficiently to win the ball back. So, yeah, I'd say those are the two areas, dominating possession to create chances and score goals and and winning the ball back immediately after losing possession. OK, so looking at that out of possession first, because I prefer out of possession as being an ex-defender, 
Um, how do you ingrain that into your sessions? So you're talking about the comfortable, uncomfortable, secure, insecure. How do you um, get the players to identify what secure or what insecure possession looks like? And how do you train that during training sessions so hopefully it then comes out at a weekend? Yeah, I think um, using Huddle is, is massive in academies now. I think Huddle is a really, really good uh, platform for, for kids to use. Um, and you can have open dialogue um, across the, the Huddle sort of analysis platform. You can um, share playlists and share clips prior to training, get players to comment upon certain moments, annotate those clips so the players can understand what it is perhaps you're you're going to be working on in training that particular week to link into the, the, the focus and topics at the weekend for, in the games program. So we'd spend time um, in analysis sessions on a weekly basis, formal analysis sessions, usually on a Friday prior to then going out and training. But then there'll be more informal sort of across the week um, analysis sort of discussions. We get clips up on the TVs in the changing room and we'd show clips of best practice, whether that's first team, or more ideally, we'd show clips of the boys in games, sort of games past or sessions that we'd already trained. And, and we speak about these particular moments. So we'd speak about moments when the possession in that example looks uncomfortable, insecure, pause the video, look at it, look at the, the network of players in that moment, have some Q&A, get the players up and, and, and anal analysing their own performances. Um, really interactive, I, I would say, that... Is, is the best approach to to learn this sort of tactical detail, but using analysis in that instance and using clips of the players in games was a really, really useful tool because it it's all well and good them seeing first team games and best practice clips, but to see themselves in moments that they can more so relate to, I think you, you, you start to garner really um, efficient learning and transferable learning onto the pitch because they're living it in the moment themselves but yeah i'd say as a visual tool using using, using huddle and, and other analysis platforms it is really really useful and what about in terms of session design on that front yeah i think it's a case of, of learning the language the encoded language so trying to avoid long explanations of, of coaching moments we used to be very very concise with our coaching messages close the center Overload the wings was something that we spoke about a lot to a large extent. And these are really clear messages that allow the boys to understand what's been asked of them in any given in any given time and moment on the pitch. So, yeah, clarity of, of language, age appropriate wording, um, getting the boys to to where possible drive the sessions themselves. So they're the ones that um, are coaching each other. I think it's all well and good to coach coaching from the sidelines, but there's got to be a moment and a stage within a young person development. And even in the foundation phase, when you want to see them driving it themselves, and that's where real deep learning starts to happen. Um, so yeah, I'd say clarity of language really is, is, is the main, is the main sort of learning tool that the kids need to understand, learn and, 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 and roll with if, um, eventually over the long term to, to drive it themselves when they're training and playing. And then, I'm going to use this as an example now. You may not have done many of them, but say, for example, you've got a, a rondo, for example, and you're, you're looking or trying a Italian square type things. You've got 2v2 in the middle, a target player for each team on each end, and they're trying to get the ball from one end to the other for people that are listening and might not know what Italian square is. Um, in that context, where a ball's coming from an outside player into the group and then he's trying to receive the play forward how do you get the secondary player to understand whether he's got good possession and is comfortable on the ball or whether he's uncomfortable and then needs to think about either one his supporting angle to make him comfortable or two that he may well lose this so I need to be in a position to win it back how do you go around getting them to identify that what like triggers would there be I think that goes back to some of what we spoke about earlier, the difference between Cat 3 players at times and Cat 1 players. So when you, were, when you were describing that situation then, the image I had in my head was of players being able to turn, open their hips, open their shoulders up, be front-facing, be in a position to, to travel or pass forwards. That often um, could be a trigger 
for that player's partner or teammate to make a forward run, to try and create space, to receive or create space for the player to be able to move with the ball. But when you go work in cap ones, you might have a player who's able to have his back to play, have instant pressure from behind, have pressure coming from the side or from the front and be able to turn and wriggle out of that and, and, and evade that pressure and get out of that 1v2 or even 1v3 scenario and be in a position to, to turn the game forwards and dribble and score or combine with their teammates. So it's really, really difficult in that there's no one concrete answer to that. I think it's knowing the players in that moment and some players are so adept and, and, and proficient at wriggling out of any sort of outnumbered scenario that if their teammate knows that's what their super strength is, no matter what the pressure is on them, they're probably going to disconnect from them and detach from them and make forward runs because they know that they're going to be able to evade that pressure and eventually wriggle out of it or find the next connecting pass. So, yeah, of course, there's triggers regarding um, when to make forward runs and when to start going closer to the ball, anticipating a loss of possession. But it's understanding your players as well. And some players really embrace and, and want that pressure because they know that they're going to be able to wriggle out of it because they're just so efficient in those moments. So, yeah, I think it's the players understanding each other's super strengths in that type of um, moment, I'd say. I think that's really interesting. Um, just from from what you're saying there, like you look at maybe, let's use Spurs as, as an example, because it's a good one. Undumbele, I would back 1v1 to be able to wriggle out and get himself moved. Whereas you look at someone like Hoiberg or Skip at the moment, they may not be able to do that. So I think it's really interesting you saying that actually it isn't a trigger on this is generically what we're going to do. It's probably a trigger for that individual. So what does uncomfortable look like for them? Or what mm. does comfortable look like for that player? Because Eden Hazard against four might be very different to uh, whoever we're, we're against four, which is really interesting. So how do you get that level of self-awareness in the group? So how do you encourage them to look at one another and understand what, the players around them can or cannot do. Yeah. In um in my second season at Arsenal, we had a a, a Dutch head of coaching. And the the philosophy then was based upon the, the C D E F model, which was um very much down the the tactical periodization that Raymond Verheyen sort of um uh, educates coaches to 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 understand. So the C standing for communication communication always comes they call it communication of the highest order so it's always the first element when it's in any coaching or football interaction on the pitch um and it's non-verbal it's a non-verbal communication so we we spoke to the players a lot about eye contact about watching players hips watching players shoulders watching players feet um and understanding their body language when they're with the ball about to receive the ball moving with the ball or about to win the ball back. Um, and it's reading those non-verbal body language sort of moments to understand what that means for you and what how that dictates what your interaction is with that player. A simple example might be a player, um, I don't know, a right-hand-sided player looking to make a long sort of 20, 30-yard diagonal pass to a left-hand-sided player. So you've got the right-hand-sided player, eyes down, looking at the ball, leg going back, the trigger there being for the left-hand sided player, this ball's going to this ball's going to reach me. This this player's looking to to play a mid sort of long range pass, so I'm going to make that run. So it's using those sort of non-verbal body language moments to dictate what the next action looks like. So that's really how we we try to educate the boys to to understand each other's abilities on and off the ball just to study each other. And um, and yeah, when you're trying to go into that detail with, with young players, it's, it's hard because it's, it's quite deep. It's quite deep thinking and it's uh, it's very educational for the staff. It was very educational for the staff, let alone the players. Um, but yeah, that was the C. The D was uh, decision-making. The E was execution. And the F was football fitness. So that the way that the, the model works is that, of course, communication comes first. Then a decision is made as to what sort of pass in the moment I've just described. It could be a clipped pass, a lofted pass, um, but then the execution comes second. So you're not going to execute a particular football action until a decision's been made upon what that technique is going to look like. 
So CDE was how, how it was sold as a, as a model, communication, decision, execution. And then the F is football fitness really encompasses all of that together. So football fitness, meaning how many football actions can you connect together in any one sequence? How well, how well can you maintain your football actions over the course of a, an 80-minute game or a 120-minute training session? Um, yeah, that, that was the model that was used at that time. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Uh, I'm just wondering if you were to sit the kids down for 10 minutes at the start of the session and have all of their names on a sheet and go, tell me what that player's super strength is, whether what answers you'd get back and whether they are actually acutely aware of the fact that that is what their super strength is. And then, like you said there, okay, well, how do they communicate that? So if, if it's this person's really quick, how do you know they're going to try and run past the person and get them to try and break it down? I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it and maybe, yeah, some, some, something to explore for sure. I think kids are so perceptive of each other and, um, and understand each other more than perhaps we as coaches give them credit for at times. Kids are so aware of each other's super strengths and where they fit often within that, that almost that hierarchy at times. Kids, I think in my time, in my experience, know where they sit, either technically, tactically, physically. Not that we're always sort of um, encouraging the players to compare each with each other. I think that's a dangerous thing, comparison. But of course, they're naturally going to do that in a, in a team environment. Um, but yeah, I think they're very aware and perceptive of, of what their strengths are, what others' strengths are. And as well as that, perhaps what their limitations are as well. And those that aren't as perceptive, that's part of our job, I think, to, to help them understand that for the betterment of them improving as, as players, of course. Yeah, I think that um, I th it's probably assessing, isn't it? If you're playing against someone three nights a week prior to a game on Sunday, you're assessing what they're good at, what they're not so good at. Like, I wouldn't get in a race with Theo Walcott or whoever because I know I'm not going to win that race. So actually, what do I need to do? in order to manufacture a situation where I'm not getting in a race with him. And I think what you're saying there, you know, being aware of who you're playing against, what does that mean? How do I need to act to give them challenges probably links down to that. And linking to what you're saying here, and I guess th this could, could be challenging, but you, you've mentioned kind of, the, the, I guess, the level of player coming from a cat three to a cat one. Now, speaking purely from myself, uh, and I can talk about if it's fine, from I would have wanted to have played higher than QPR idea. I would have wanted to play for Tottenham and England, all that type of stuff and whatnot. So how do you go around with those cat free players, helping them identify where they are at the moment? And obviously some of them are going to aspire to try and make that jump, or some of them may have come from those cat one academies, been released, have come down to here and going to want to jump back up. How do you go around helping them assess where they currently are and understand what they may need to do if they were able to make that jump back up to a cap two or cap three or be competitive at that level? Yeah, so, so really good question, actually. I think, again, going back to sort of previous point, getting them to watch themselves back, I just think that's such a, a valuable learning tool because you get a totally different perspective for having played the game to then watch yourself back afterwards. So I think to, to use again, as, as, we, as I mentioned just previously, to use huddle sometimes to just encourage, perhaps not on the, the same day, like for example, a Sunday, um, to sit down on that Sunday night and re-watch the game back. I think it's asking quite a lot of our kids having sort of played the game that day, but at some stage where possible before the next session, can you watch the game back? Can you, can you, clip some moments that relate to perhaps your individual development plan that obviously you'd imagine have been created sometime in the early stages of the season. Can you relate your performance within training, which would obviously get filmed as well when you're at a Cat One Club? Can you really start to build a library and, and catalogue of, of clips of yourself to, to see your own development over the, the, the course and throughout the, the, the months um, of a season? The ones that do that show their keenness to improve. The ones that don't, I think that tells you a lot as well, whether that's through time or just the not having the, the provision to be able to do it. But that's when you can help them, particularly in the cap one. You can, you've got the facility, you can go into the classroom, you can sit with a small group of players or even do one-to-one -one intentional work and, 
um, and sit down with, with these players before training or after training, before or after games, and get the um, the game up on on the big screen and 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 freeze frame it and and get into those one to one conversations. That's the that's what you're able to do at Cap One because you've got the time and and the and the scope to be able to do it. Very different at Cap Three when the facilities perhaps don't allow that or the games aren't filmed quite so often. So. Yeah, that's the real difference again, that you've probably got a, a, a better, or not a better, a, a more relevant um, and sort of positive environment to be able to to give them that service, I think, to, to, to become more self-aware of, of where they are currently and where you want them and where they want to get to themselves. Yeah, and I guess one thing I did find amazing in London, which you probably don't have here, is kind of the, the, the cage culture, but also school football in terms of they will have other people in their school or around the corner for them that play for Chelsea or play for West Ham and you're you're at QPR at the moment and you can see what the difference is in those players and I have have you got any examples of someone who has made that jump that you've worked with previously that has gone from you know Dagenham to Southend to maybe a Chelsea or West Ham or Tottenham or Arsenal and what they were able to do within your environment that helped them make that jump? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm always fearful of, of naming names. So I'm, obviously I won't be doing that in this particular sort of um, discussion point, but there was a particular player at South End who I first met as an under nine. And he was uh, not that we're ever pigeonholing players at that age, but he was a more attack minded player, a wide attack minded player. Um, very, very athletic. Um, as the seasons progressed, and it was always thought very highly within that particular age group, but got into the youth development phase, started to do day release, um, and there were conversations and, and rumours of other clubs being interested, London-based Category 1 clubs. The player went on trial at certain clubs, spent a week at Liverpool, um, spent time at, at the London clubs themselves, and eventually um, was, was sold to Manchester City um, as a... 14-year-old, I believe. Um, he's thriving in the environment there now, as far as I'm aware. Um, I believe he, he would be, what, 19 now, I think, in and around, obviously, uh, with the 23s, in and around training with the first team. Um, fantastic move for, for, for the player. Um, an amazing environment to, to, to be in every day. World-class um, provision he's got there and, and education. But it was really humble beginnings. My, my earliest memory were on a um, a tour of Germany with this particular player. He was he was um, nominated as the player of the tournament as an under nine. Um, yeah, one wonderful little player, great kid, um, and it's just such a feel good story that a player can can make that make that start as a category three player and and have the drive and ambition. And of course, there were difficult moments along the way and we supported him with, with growth mindset and there were, were challenging moments when he doubted himself. Um, and we, we spoke with the family at times around the time that other clubs were starting to express their interests. And I think when you're in a Cat 3 club and, and a player's getting that level of interest, it's such a, a massive um, plus for the academy that you've got a player of that type within your, within your, um, within your programme. And I think it speaks volumes of, of the coaching that, that he, he had at that time and all the coaches that worked with him, I think, can be very proud of the work that they did um, and the academy management team as well. Um, yeah, and I, there's, there's two or three others that are quite similar situations as, as well. But it goes to show that these players, when they're perhaps they, perhaps they miss the boat at Cap 1 and Cap 2 when they're in pre-academy or in those early stages of foundation phase, that, that it's never too late. And and you can you can make that move, and you, I think if you have that drive and those aspirations and that support behind you, then then anything's possible, really. Yeah, I think it's interesting there. You've said a couple of times drive and growth mindset, which is really interesting in terms. Of, I was my next question was going to be the characteristics that help him make that, but I think from what you're saying there, obviously driven and wants to improve, so he's probably driving himself to improve. And I think what you said at the end regarding the you know, being able to make that jump up. Uh, the, the more time I spend around academy football, I think it's about finding the right environment. And that might be a Cat 3, a Cat 2, a Cat 1, but it's finding the right environment with the right people for that individual to flourish. 
And it sounds like in his specific example, that was probably the perfect environment for him to get exposure at different challenges and be resilient at different points, which is uh, really, really interesting. So moving on slightly now, um, obviously, I know we just went back and forth a little bit regarding some of your experiences. And one of the things I noticed uh, when we discussed was around the content creator at Football DNA. Um, do you just want to yeah. explain to people kind of what that is, what Football DNA, DNA is, and then what you actually do in that role, what kind of content you create, etc.? Yeah, so so football DNA. I've been sort of working with uh, with Stuart, who's the co-founder of, of the platform, um, for for several months now, pretty much since the summer. So football DNA is an online uh, platform for grassroots coach and player development. So they've got um, a really extensive um, website and and social media presence. So they're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Um, they have over a thousand coaching videos, sessions, and practices. So live sessions recorded from, from coaches around the world, animated sessions as well. They have individual skills programs for players with, with over 100 challenges for one-to-one for -one technical execution work, outfield and goalkeeper content, sports science, well-being and, and nutrition sort of elements to the, to the, to the website and, and the, uh, the, the platform as well. I've written some articles so, um, for the website which have come out recently and they're coming out over the coming months as well. They have tactical analysis, um, videos and articles. Uh, they have a podcast. They run regular coaches forums, which I've been involved with, and, and webinars as well. And I'm just finishing off a, a youth development phase uh, curriculum, a season-long curriculum. So they have e-books and animated um, curriculums on the website as well. It's subscription-based, so there's a, a membership sort of a program to, to, uh, to the platform. But there's so much content on there for but the coaches of all levels, be that grassroots to academy and for players themselves to have access to it, to, to, to watch the one-to-one the -one work, to, to be filmed and have exposure from a playing perspective as well and be on social media as a, as a player is, um, is great exposure and promotion for the kids also that I've been involved with, with running sessions that have been put onto, uh, onto those sort of platforms. And um, yeah, just a really extensive and, um, and exciting uh, online platform that I would, would strongly su suggest lots of coaches and, and players um, have a look at and, and, and have access to. And then from, from your perspective, what drew you towards actually creating a little bit of content or a lot of content and actually um, being involved in, in the product in the first place? Yeah, I when I got involved with Football Dinner, I, it was at a time where I'd, I'd left Arsenal. I had more time on my hands. I was looking to try and do something a little bit different. Always been interested in in sessions being filmed. And I think it's such a, a valuable educational tool to, to watch yourself coach, to be mic'd up and, and to watch the session from a, from a different perspective rather than being live within the session itself because you just see so much more. You really pick up on the things that you've said. Are there any things that when you say them, you, you repeat yourself a lot? What's your coaching position like? What's your body language like? Um, have you affected every player within the session? What your session design looks like from afar? What your progressions look like? Um, so I was, I was just keen to get involved with it from, from my own sort of development initially. Um, but the the longer I've been involved with with, uh, with the guys, it's just it's great to see the kids... Uh, enjoy being filmed and then for them to watch themselves back as well as, as I said um, and there's just so much interesting content on there I've really enjoyed doing the tactical analysis videos I sit there in my conservatory my tactics table and I put my video camera up and um, it, it's crazy because you you, uh, you you design and you draw up a rough draft of a particular topic so one I did last week was on counter pressing and you think right it's going to be a seven or eight minute tactical analysis video i'm going to talk about three main points and you think okay that shouldn't be too hard two hours later you're still filming and you've probably done about 50 takes because you stumble over your words or you 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 uh, lose your train of thought it's a lot lot harder than you think um but there's almost like a little sort of sense of pride when you, you you put that video together i'm sure it's similar to yourself and your podcast michael to be honest once you uh when you edit it and it's all done and it gets gets out there on social media, something that you can be quite proud of, that you've been able to, to do something a bit different. And I think that's stepping out of your comfort zone as well. 
because it's not something that every coach finds easy to talk into a camera on your own and to, to be succinct and uh, put your messages across with, with clarity that others are going to understand. So that's something that I really enjoyed doing. And then we've been doing some webinars with coaches from around the world. Did one last week to a group of coaches in America, spoken to a group of coaches in Dubai. So then you're starting to think about time differences. So I've sat up till sort of early hours of the morning speaking to these guys. And yeah, just a really interesting um, and different way of, of working in football, I think, um, from a, yeah, from a sort of different, quite a different angle. And in terms of reflections that have then affected your uh, coaching in a practical setting, is there anything you've taken away from doing this or anything that those webinars where someone's jotted a question in the chat box that's challenged you that you've actually gone, yeah, why don't I shift my session like this? Or why don't I put that adaptation in? Is there anything that springs to mind in, in that sense? Yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm really interested and, in- and keen on on numbers and uh, and the use of of numbers in in coaching sessions. So I, I I saw this recently, and it's something that I've I've used previously myself anyway. But the rule of three, so our, our brains can only process a maximum generally of three pieces of information at a time. So I tend to to try where possible to coach in threes a lot. So when I'm giving coaching uh, information or um, tactical insight information, I'll try to be as concise and as succinct within those three almost bullet pointed messages at a time because I know that that's probably easier for me to recall and it's going to be pretty more simplistic for the player to understand and be able to apply so that's the rule of three I, I, I use the the rule of 10 so generally our um, research suggests that after 10 minutes your brains can often go into uh, into autopilot and start to to drift a little bit. So within those 10 minutes of a session, I'm thinking already, how can the, the session be modified to keep the level of interest and motivation? Are there certain players within this first 10 minutes that need an individual challenge? Are there certain individuals within this first 10 minutes that need um, a regression of some kind? They need some sort of differentiation sort of element to make it more um, applicable to them and relevant to them within the, the, those first opening minutes. So I'm thinking about what the first 10 minutes looks like within a session as well and each 10-minute block thereafter. And then I'm also aware of the rule of 30. So I use that as 30 seconds. So where possible, at the beginning of a a coaching session or a practice um, or a game, I try and get the players on task within 30 seconds. And if I'm struggling after 30 seconds, I'm thinking, is the session too complex? Could I have outlined it more briefly, got them on task, and then started to introduce the other intricacies and elements within the session over the course of that 30 minute practice. So yeah, rule of three, rule of 10, rule of 30. Um, And when you watch yourself back on film, you can really note when you've you've stuck to those rules and and whether they've been um, positively utilized within the session for the benefit of the players. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point. I I remember being observed around ball rolling time. I know that was a whole, whole thing and, the the level of interaction you're having and how long pro, how prolonged the periods are is obviously a, a really interesting one. I guess flipping this to your coach development side, which um, you've done a little bit of at Watford, and obviously in your new role there'll be an aspect of that as well. How would you go around um, constructively challenging individuals on that, or maybe supporting them in that area? Because I know myself when I was a younger coach, I used to chat for, for days. I know other coaches that would have been the same, other coaches that maybe would have want to get in best intentions, get a load of technical information across. How would you go around supporting them so you go, actually, no, we're going to keep this clean, we're going to keep this concise, and we're going to allow the kids to play and have a go at it, and you can step in again in four minutes if you need to. How would you go around supporting them in that area? Yeah. My my coach development sort of um, approach is very much based around watching the players. I think if you can relate that to perhaps observing a primary school teacher or a secondary school teacher, I think you get as much benefit through observing, analysing and assessing the the kids in that class or the players within that session from a coaching perspective to sort of see 
the effectiveness of the coach indirectly. Of course, you're going to watch the coach themselves. You're going to watch their coaching behaviours, their coaching position, how well they engage with the players. But to watch the players themselves, you watch their energy, you watch their motivation. Um, I'm a big um, believer in the, the volume level of a session. Is it a noisy session? Is it exciting? Who's driven that? If it's being driven by the players, that has to have come from somewhere. That's clearly at some stage been instilled in them by the coach. So that's a really positive coach trait if the noise level and the excitement and the energy within the session from the players is apparent themselves. What are their effort levels like? What's their willingness to listen and learn? How well do they interact and engage with each other? What's their confidence like to express themselves? So from a coach development angle, I would watch the players to see if all those traits and attributes and, and visual um, images are coming out from the players. And, and if they are, that for me is the whole, shows the hallmarks of a very, very effective coach because they have established and created such a positive learning environment so the players feel safe and confident and comfortable to express themselves in that way. Um, I just think that's a real true indicator of, of quality coaching if the players behave in those particular sort of ways that I've just described. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. I think that's a brilliant way of doing it rather than just focusing on the coach, actually look at the end result and you're almost back, back dating it, if you like, and going, okay, what's the end result here? And then let's work through the process backwards. And again, this is going to be a really hard question potentially for you to answer. But now in, in, in modern day coaching, you get a lot of co-coaching. So how do you assess, um, I guess, again, looking at the kids, but how, how do you assess how much of it is an individual coach or a pair of coaches? Because I, I would imagine there'd be points where actually the tandem of that coaching team just works really well together and actually if you separated them out they may not be as effective because of their personality traits or whatever but when they're together that pair really invigorate the kids really um take care of all the needs and it might be you've got one introvert one extrovert and just the way they mesh together works really well so how do you manage looking at a coaching team collaborative collaboratively and work out whether it's an individual or it is the effect of just both of them being highlighting each other's strengths if you know what I mean yeah I think yeah it's a great question in my recent experiences there's been more of that in, in academy football coaches working together whether that's working alongside each other within one practice or working in smaller groups um, I really enjoyed the approach of, of topic and counter topic within sessions. So, for example, one coach is working on start the attack, playing out from the back. The other coach is working on a high block press because they're, they're going to be opposites. So that, that's a topic and a counter topic. I think as long as the coaches are, are planned, and one thing we did at Arsenal was always sit down for a good length of time before each session to talk about what our own... Um, relationship was going to look like within the session itself who was responsible for which element at what point we were going to work together um when there were when there was going to be one voice within the session when there was going to be two voices from the session and i think if you approach the the practice in that way you're never going to cross each other's paths and distract each other interfere with each other's messages um contradict each other so it all comes from attention to detail and planning, um, whether one coach on a match day, for example, is looking at in possession and one's looking at out of possession, one's going to manage the game, one's going to work with individuals, one's going to work with them um, from an individual learning program, an ILP sort of perspective, and not get involved in team tactics and, and team um, units and, 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 and strategy, et cetera. So I'd say planning and preparation is key when you're working um, from that sort of collaborative sort of perspective um, to make sure that it works and it's slick and it's fluid um, and the boys understand which coach is responsible for which element and which objective within the practice itself. Yeah, I think that makes complete sense. I think that also, particularly with the younger ones, it's nice to have one of the coaches who maybe can be a little bit silly of an evening or can engage so like if someone does a really good goal they can act like they've won the world cup final and go a bit crazy because 
it is a strenuous season and it is a strenuous program. So actually for them to know, oh, this evening, right, he's going to be the one who's going to be making a fuss about me if I score, if I make a good block. That balance between having one who can do that whilst the other one manages the session is a really nice environment to create. So I think it's uh, definitely something that as as this kind of co-coaching evolves it'll be interesting to see what type of route this goes down I think and I think you almost end up with like superstar pairs whereas a pair these two just collaborate brilliantly and you might try and separate them and they might not be as effective but together they're really sought after because the environment they create and how well they work together with the MDT and the kids themselves and all that type of stuff. I call it the, the the boy band analogy, isn't it? So as soon as the boy band, for the most part, splits and go on their solo careers, it's never quite the same, is it? You know, um, but when they're together, um, and in this example of coaches working together, there are certain individuals that I've worked with and seen that they're almost made for each other, and they bounce off each other really, really well, and they almost come as a pair, like you've just said. So when there's conversations about who's going to be working with which age group in the following season rather than speak about them as individuals, often you'll speak about them together because you know what a good job they do for, for, for the development of the boys as, as, as young people and as footballers. So, yeah, so it's, um, it's something that I've seen as, as, as a more common way of coaching in, in, in recent times in academies, for sure. Okay, so we, we're, we're quite close to time. We've allotted for this. So I'm going to ask you one last question before I, um, before I end the call, which is who's the... Mo, who's the best player or coach you've worked with or against and why? Best coach. I'm going to go for two. Can I have one that's um, fictional? That's absolutely fine. Yeah, go on. It's, this is a different one, so I'm looking forward to this answer. Yeah, I don't know if you've been watching uh, Ted Lasso. I haven't, but I haven't everyone's been telling me to watch it. Apparently, it's pretty oh, good. Right. I'll tell you what. I um, if I could be Ted Lasso as I go into my sort of latter years of my coaching journey, I would be more than happy because he comes out with absolute pearls of wisdom. And the concept of the show is that he is um, he's an American, has no knowledge of of football. Um, I think he, what was he? He was an American football coach that got drafted over to work with a, an English, uh, a make believe English Premier League team. But he has these these gold dust quotes and moments that are so powerful. Um, I've got a couple written down, which I've, I've, I've even started using them myself in sessions. Um, and they're all based around growth mindset and players making mistakes and, and knowing how to deal with them from a, a positive perspective. So one thing he says to a particular player in this, in this one scene that I'm picturing, this player's made sort of regular mistakes within the session and he's talking to this player you know, after after the practice and he says, um, he asks him, he says, do you know what the happiest animal on earth is? And the player says, no, I, I don't know. And, and Ted Lasso says, the goldfish. He says, do you know why? It's got a 10 second memory. Be a goldfish. So the whole concept behind that is that you need to brush off those mistakes, have a short term memory try and live in the moment, try not to dwell upon things that have happened previously, try not to let it affect your next football moment within the practice or, or the game. Um, these little quotes, I think, are so powerful with young players. He also says living in the moment is a gift. That's why they call it the present. So try not to, to as I say, dwell upon mistakes you've made um, and, and errors that you've made because they've gone. You can't affect them. You can only affect your next moment and you need to approach it with positivity. So I don't know whether that's allowed or not with this answer to your question, but I would strongly advise any football coach, sports coach, teacher, parent to watch Ted Lasso because you can learn so much. And some of the, the pearls of wisdom that he comes out with, you can use with your kids, with your players, with your pupils. Um, there's, there's so much cool stuff to, to pick up on from um, sort of a, a growth mindset sort of perspective, I'd say. So that's my fictional one. Was, was that allowed? That's fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. That's perfect. <laughs> my, my real life one, uh, I would say, is a, is a coach called Luke Williams. 
who I work with at the Football Association. I worked at the FA for nearly four years from sort of 2007 uh, to sort of 2010 um, in the FA Skills Programme. So Luke is currently the assistant head coach at Swansea City alongside Russell Martin. Um, and he worked with him at, at MK Dons prior to that as well. But he was an FA Skills coach like us working in sort of a community-based programme. You could tell straight away that it perhaps wasn't the right environment for him. He was, um, his, his game knowledge and game insight was, was so vast. He was still a good player at the time. So he was able to put on sessions and, and, and demonstrate within those sessions at such a high level that it was clear that he wasn't going to be within that program for very long. And he went straight into academy football not long after. Um, he's worked at Brighton. He was uh, he progressed into becoming the first team manager at Swindon and then to the roles that I've just mentioned there. But his his attention to detail and clarity was fantastic with his coaching messages. He was so relatable to the kids that he worked with. Um, great rapport with the kids, fantastic banter with the kids of all different ages, particularly the slightly older ones. Um, but his game insight and knowledge of football playing principles and his ability to articulate that to individuals and to groups was, was, was the best that I've seen. Um, and I didn't work with him for very long, um, which was a shame for me because I, I, I learned so much from him in such a short space of time, but he's gone on to, to, to achieve so much in the professional game and he's still a young coach himself. So I would say he's the, the best football coach that I've worked with as far as technical detail, game understanding and ability to articulate his coaching messages. Yeah, really good answer, I think. Um, and it shows kind of from this conversation and bit we've had before time, kind of your two sides, which is the, you know, understanding the kids, understanding their development, try and use analogies. Um, I know we didn't touch on this, but you've written a couple of children's books and stuff as well, which is, is great. And then obviously you've got the, the real football tactical and technical side, which goes alongside that. So listen, really appreciate your time. A, a great conversation and hopefully we can catch up again soon. Brilliant. Yeah. Cheers, Michael. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. And, uh, and good luck with uh, these future episodes. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening to the Sports Initiative podcast with me, Michael Wright. Please remember to follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram at the Sports Initiative podcast and share this podcast with friends and family. I'll see you next week.